welcome to Anything But Ordinary with Spooky and Raven. That's right, it's us again. Tonight's topic is Urban Legends of Time Travelers. I am your host, Spooky, and here is your other host, the most awesome Raven. Wow, hey. I do feel a little awesome. Well, I'm happy for you. <laughs> so, it's been a little bit since we haven't been on, you know, because, again, health stuff a little bit but we had to take a little break because there are a couple things that went on but you know we're finally doing a topic that we've been wanting to talk about for like since we started which has been like over a year you know right we have like so many ideas and thoughts and we banter about so many things you know it's just like oh we have like a notebook ton of all these show ideas of everything we want to talk about at some point and it's just... <clears throat> I know it's just hard to <clears throat> excuse me it's just hard to get to them all. Well, we d we just don't know which one, you know, we're like, oh, we'll do this one next. And we're going to do this one. And then we forget and we start talking, we get on another subject and, uh, hey, let's check this out, you know, or we also get ideas and stuff from my reels. But, you know, um, I don't, I've always kind of been fascinated with the idea of time traveling and, and you know, science fiction, some stuff like that and paranormal. And, and we're always into like a lot of different things, you know what I mean? But... You know, tonight we kind of decided just to, because this is going to, we're going to do multiple shows when it comes to time travel, because there's so many things that you can talk about when it comes to this topic. Or, exactly. And or people who are involved in it or stories involving some people or whatever. But tonight we're going to kind of do like a more of a lighter version when it comes to the topic of time traveling. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Urban legends of people who have who have time traveled or experienced time slips or what have you. Yeah. And although you and I plan to have future shows covering a lot more uh, when it comes to this topic, there's just so much on I When, when I started researching this, I could not believe how much was on this subject. Well, yeah, but I mean, I've always kind of read little books here, you know, when you watch, like you've seen stuff like through, the Twilight Zone, you got like Doctor Who and all these different things, or like even when you, you know, I think one of the first times I've ever really experienced or thought about time travel is when you first heard that book, um, Ebenezer, you know, even though yeah. he's the ghost of past, present, and future, kind of gives you the idea of time traveling and stuff, but the thing is, um, I mean, there's so many things, you got David Anderson, he's got like tons of research and things that he's into. You know, you have the um, John um, Teeter. Yeah, Al Blinken. Yeah, I mean, there's so many different theories and stories, you know, real or fictional. You know, you got the um, DART program, you have um, uh, Project Pegasus and Montauk Project. Yeah, I mean, there's tons of things that people are always talking about or doing when it comes to this. And it's just. Eventually, I do want to get into the more serious side when we're discussing this stuff. You know, is it science fiction? You know, or, I mean, is it reality? You know, time travel, it's just, like I'm saying, it's been a source of topic over, I, I don't know, like a span of centuries, you know? It, right. People are always talking about it over, you know, drinks. You know, you got it written in novels. You have it to internet blogs. I mean, we've seen it in movies and TV, you know. And, um, is it possible for people to slip in and out of dimensions, you know, le leaping kind of like back and forth throughout time? You know, I don't, I don't know, you know, but it's, I find it would be kind of cool. You know what I mean? But I mean, you and I, we don't have the answer. It's no, just something don't. I've always just found to be an interesting topic that I always seem to bring up through, you know, throughout multiple conversations we have always had, you know? Well, there are a lot of people out there that either believe in time travel or the possibility of time travel. And I'm going to say right up front, I personally do not believe in it, okay? I may believe in different planes of existence, but I do not believe that a person is capable of traveling through time. Mm -hmm. But, <laughs> however, <laughs> this didn't stop me from uh, once answering an ad I saw by a man who claimed to travel through time and was looking for a partner. You, what? You answered a, like yeah, a love, what, um, what is it, like a love ad or something? Were you like, look, were you standing in the grocery store and you pick up a piece of paper and you're just looking through like the partner ad or whatever? I, I forget where I saw the ad, but I came across this ad one time and out of sheer boredom and for S and G's and I decided to answer it. And the thing of it is, see, when I'm bored, Well, what did real... it say? I mean, 
Well, when I'm bored, there really is no telling what I will do to entertain myself, and answering ridiculous ads is one of my favorite things to do, but uh, the ad stated that a gentleman was looking for uh, someone to travel through time with him, and he stated that they had to be a good shot and furnish their own weapons, and uh, he also stated that he couldn't guarantee the person's safety, so I answered the ad. And I told him that I was a crack shot, and I listed all the guns that I would be taking with me. And I also stated that I could more than take care of myself. And that, you know, I mean, that I absolutely could take care of myself and that I was real handy in a fight. But unfortunately, to this day, I haven't received an answer to my application. Right. And Either the ad was fake or the person placing the ad just did not believe that a female would be a suitable partner, especially in a physical fight, well, which maybe. makes you kind of wonder what kind of places he's time traveling to. Well, it just, maybe he had already left bef prior, right before you answered his. Well, that could be true. Maybe my application hasn't gotten to him yet. You know, that's not the first crazy ad that you've told me about that you, you that you've um, answered, you know, but what would no, you have done? No, it's not. But what would you have done if this dude actually responded back? Would you have continued on with the conversation and seen sure, if actually I would have. he'd I actually just had the, was a I time travel? I would have carried it on to see how far he'd take it. Sure, I would have. But, like I said, you know, when I'm bored, you just don't know what I'll do, you know? I mean, I'll, I'm like, likely to do just about anything to entertain myself, and I like ad, I like responding to ridiculous ads. Sometimes you get some really interesting responses. Maybe he was like, <clears throat> I don't even know. You probably go way back in the Maybe he thought, well, any... age or something. <laughs> maybe so. Maybe he thought, wow, this woman is... If she's crazy enough to answer this ad, maybe she's too crazy to be around. I don't know. So you forgot to tell him that you know how to bake. No, I don't know. <laughs> it's not. Well, okay, I admit, I know how to bake, but it's not one of my favorite things to do. Honest, to tell you the truth, I, I think I would like to be able to travel back and forth in time. <coughs> but only, like, in the sense where you could, like, you know, more of, like, be a, the observer. Not where you could alter it in a way where you could do some damage. You know, where you could still participate and, you know, leap back and forth during whatever time period and stuff, but you didn't really change other people's outcomes in a way where you still allowed them to have free will, you know what I mean? Right. But, I mean, I think it would be awesome to be able to go back to, like, certain events that took place and just, like, meet certain people throughout this planet's history. I mean, just to have conversations with them or to be able to just to listen to some of them speak in person... And not just go off of what their supposed life history was from these books that we read from. But, I mean, I would love to, like, you know, even, like, Nikola Tesla. That would be a guy I would totally like to meet. You know, because he, you know, there's stuff that goes around that's saying, he, you know, Tesla himself discovered um, by accident, you know, the secrets of, like, t you know, traveling through time. And it's like he even, you know, from what people are saying is that he even knew the dangers of what could possibly happen you know, when you, right. you know, altered with the, the laws of the cosmos, you know what I'm saying? But yeah. I always found Tesla to be, like, this amazing guy. And I kind of want to do a show, a, a whole show just on him alone. Because he was, he was, like, always experimenting with, like, tons of things. I mean, he had, like, free energy. I mean, he was looking into stuff like invisibility, the x-ray machine. Like, there's, like, so many things. He was, like, probably, like, one of the awesomest geeks ever of all time. And I the, just saw a documentary on him, and I found him to be fascinating. Well, the one thing is, is, like, he, he was, like, an amazing dude. And his name and, and his well-being were basically destroyed by certain well-known known families, you know? Right. And it's just, like, and it's because he wanted to give free energy and everything else, and they couldn't make bank off that, you know? But that's right. just for, I mean, I'm not going to totally go into Tesla, because that's totally for, like, another show. I'm going to kind of just stick to time travelers. But, um, I, I mean, is there alternate existences? I mean, do you think, you know, there's a place where people have the ability already and know how to travel dimensionally? I mean, I guess you don't. But, I mean, I always kind of <laughs> ponder and thought, you know, you never know. 
You know what I mean? Because maybe the people we pass daily on the outside world are visitors from like a total different dimension or a different reality time. And they're just like taking like a little vacay, you know? Yeah. Like, hey, I'm going to take my vacation. I'm going back to 1982. Not that there I'm going go. to 82, but, you know. <laughs> well, okay. It's like I said, I don't believe in time travel. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. I've, I've not seen anything yet that has convinced me of it. But I will say this. If time travel was possible... There are certain times in history that I would like to go back to, and I would like to see it for myself, or there are, you know, historic figures that I would like to go talk to. Yeah, and see if it, you know, you know what, it, what is factual and what wasn't. And Nikola Tesla actually is one of the people that I would love to go back and talk to. But um, I, it, it's like I said, I just, I, you know, for my two cents, I just don't believe right now that it's possible. You know, both of us kind of know when it comes to this topic, people are going to lean one way or the other, you know, it, right. as, as far as when it comes to the possibilities and to each their own. You know, tonight we're not really here to try to convince anyone of anything. We're just kind of, you know, like I said, we're going to do like a lighter version when it comes to time travel tonight, but there's always going to be other future shows when it comes to where we're going to be more serious. But tonight we're just going to kind of like share some stories and or experiences of people who claimed, you know, quote unquote, claim to have these unexplainable moments, you know, kind of like when it comes to time travel or just having like glimpses into other dimensional realities, you know? Right. Real or fictional, it's, it's for the listeners to decide. You know, people can make a drinking game out of the words I keep saying because I've noticed I keep always saying, you know, you know, you know, you I don't know, talk that know. way in person. <laughs> But people are going to, you know, college people or whoever are going to start making a drinking game. Every time Raven says, you know, you have to take a shot. <laughs> so be <laughs> drunk before the first hour is even up. But um, I'm going to try to quit saying, you know. <laughs> so I was surfing the web, you know, kind of looking for time travel stories. And I didn't know really what I was going to come up upon, you know. And like I was saying, like other shows that we've had, I always mentioned that if you could get like everybody into one room, and they told their experiences, it would, you know, their experiences and stuff when it comes to the weird stuff, it would literally alter the way everyone sees the world and what we know it to be or thought it to be true. Well, I, when I was kind of, you know, surfing the net, looking for things to kind of banter about when we talked on the show, I came about this one site, it's called about.com, and I typed in time travel, and there were like several pages that came up of average people like us. Well, I don't know about you, but regular people sharing their experiences, you know, when it came to the unexplainable, you know, when it came with time and, and things dealing with that and stuff. And um, I'll post a link to that, that site later in our YouTube description, but um, it kind of amazed me that there was a lot of people having these weird experiences when it came right. to um, this kind of thing. And it kind of... Um, it kind of reminded me of something that I experienced a long a while ago and I kind of you know I remembered it but I kind of forgot it and at some point I knew it was gonna eventually this experience or this story was gonna come up during one of our shows I just you know didn't really know when and tonight it actually kind of fits or falls into this type of topic but um for those who know me they kind of know that I love to just kind of hop in my car or did, you know, not so much nowadays because gas is outrageous, but we used to just like hop in my car and I just randomly drive all over the place. You know, I just go to right. like all these unknown parts of my state just to see like how far I could get and try to get totally lost and then see if I could find my way back home without any help. And it wasn't just really like that. I just like really enjoying the open road feeling and just going on like these little excursions because you never knew what you were going to discover because there'd be like all these little small towns in that would have like all these little interesting oddities or you know like the big ball of twine or you know this one town I drove through it had like this really huge statue of a big red uh, chicken <laughs> so and then you'd always run into these really cool old abandoned buildings or you'd find like these beautiful old asylums that were just left behind of these See, now that's my favorite part of a road trip finding the old buildings well, right, but this is just random. I wouldn't, like, leave the state. I would just go how far I right. could go in one day, you know, and just drive and just see what I would discover, what I'd run into. Well, um, and I would have friends with me and stuff like that. Well, this one time, we were kind of driving around, and it was, you know, like, 
right before it was getting dark, just on the, you know, it was becoming dark, you know what I mean? And we're driving around, and then we came up to this country road type road. It was tarred and stuff, but it was heading more towards where there wasn't a lot of buildings or whatnot. And I hadn't really been down that road before, and we thought, well, hey, let's just take this road, you know. And we came upon this one um, bridge, and right before we came up to it, we both had this really odd feeling, you know. I, I don't really know how to explain the feeling that we both got. It was like a weird energy, you know. And we kind of just was like, okay, that's weird. And there was, it was going over like this river or this creek. And there was like some trees and fields around and stuff. But it was just, I don't know how to explain the feeling that we got. It was just really odd. And it seemed like as we approached and before we crossed, it was like time either like stopped or paused. It was just, I don't know how to explain this feeling, you know, because I've never experienced this before. And we were both wide awake and sober. And there's, you know what I'm saying? There's nothing that was causing us to that we'd done to make this happen, okay? But we decided, okay, we'll just go over the bridge, you know what I mean? And um, when we went over the bridge, it's like as soon as my car hit the bridge or whatever, thing, that's when things kind of got weird and time either, like, I don't know if it paused itself or what. I can't explain what happened. All that I know is that when we went over that bridge and then we came over it and then we came onto this other road, the next thing I know, all of a sudden, it was like we either projected forward somewhere because all of a sudden we weren't there anymore and we were in front of a railroad crossing and right over the railroad crossing brought us to this small town that we both already knew and we knew we were nowhere near this town at all because we were in a different direction that town was like an hour away from where we were at but it seemed like right after we crossed that bridge and turned down this one road in the country thing the next thing i know we were all of a sudden right there in front of this small town and there's no way because the one road that we had turned on that was where that bridge was, was going in the opposite direction of where this town was. And it, like I said, I don't even know how it happened. It was like the weirdest thing. We both were like really confused of how we ended up there or how we even got there as quickly as we did because it was well over an hour or so away from where we were at. And um, I just remember I don't, we just, me and her never stopped talking about that moment because it's something that we could never explain and how it happened of why we felt weird. As soon as we went onto that bridge, it was like everything went weird and the next thing we knew, we were somewhere else. And and we just, we just started calling it like the triangle bridge, you know? And it's just something, I, I, if she was even on tonight and she was on this call, she would say the exact same things I'm saying. It's just something you cannot explain. I don't know what happened. I can't explain what happened. I just know that it happened, and it was the weirdest thing that I've ever experienced. Well, probably one of the most weirdest things I've ever experienced. And um, I don't even know if I could be able to find that bridge or that road again today if you asked me, you know, but it's just, it's one of those things where you can't explain where it feels like time stopped or paused and then all of a sudden you end up somewhere where you weren't in the first place you know is that something that you explain when it comes to a time reality or a vortex experience I don't know because I've never experienced anything like this before but I know other people on the internet were sharing stories and talking about things and they had something similar that just happened to me so that made me think okay well I should share this here and normally I don't really share all this kind of stuff because I don't like people like, oh my gosh, she's a weirdo or, you know what I mean? But I'm not the <laughs> only one who's had really odd things happen to him. But this is something that's always <laughs> stuck in my head, you know, just approaching this bridge. And then right before we approached it, it was like this weird energy. And then as soon as we were crossing over it, the next thing we know, we were somewhere totally else. It, it, like basically an hour away from where we were just at. So what happened? I don't know. But it kind of fit with tonight you know what I mean as right. far as an oddity you know somebody be like oh you're a UFO abducted or you know I don't know I just know what happened and me and her cannot explain to this day but she'll she'll tell you exactly the same <coughs> um story basically what I said it's just as soon as we came upon that bridge everything just turned weird um yeah I think because I don't I can't explain somebody asked it, it, did you actually lose time and I just know that, um, I don't know. We ended up an hour away from where we were, and it seemed like it took like a split second because all we did was cross over this bridge, turn on this one road, and the next thing I know, we were right at the railroad crossing where this one town was. And 
I can't remember exactly the time now. I'd have to call and ask her again, and I could probably leave it into the descriptions and stuff. I just know that um, it was messed up. You know what I mean? I can't explain. Right. How do you explain something like that? You can't. It's just like something that happened to you, and you, it's something that you always go over and over and over in your head. And it's like a lot of people are like, oh, that's like that, you know, story of when that guy was went through this vortex or, you know, there's other people who are driving and had that same type of experience, you know. All we know is well, that when we entered it, we had that weird experience, and the next thing we know, we were somewhere else. So, in like, well, speaking of vortex, uh, that reminds me of this one story I read online. And yes, I do remember just about everything I ever read. Uh, <laughs> it was by a Dr. Raul Centino. Mm -hmm. uh, he was an investigator of the unknown, and he lives in Lima, Peru. And according to this site. Um, that you were reading? That I was reading. Uh, anywho, uh, this doctor had this patient that came in and to see him for this serious case of, of hemiplegic. And for those that don't know what that is, that is a complete paralysis of one side of the body. And uh, this patient claimed to be 30 years old but had no ID to prove it. And because she claimed she lost her identification card, uh, in his story, he spoke that it was very strange case of hemiplegic at that uh, uh, when they ran a CAT scan that there were no areas showing bleeding vessels or any traumatic lesions. So he asked her questions and the patient told him that one night she was at a campground near um, an ancient stone forest. Well, one night they were out exploring and her friends, I think the name of the forest was Mark... Mark Wasi or something like that? Mark Wasi, thank you. I think it is, I can't... I know what story you're talking about, because I remember reading okay. that. Okay, well, week, it, so. uh, we get into these kind of foreign things and I just butcher the words. We, uh, everybody does, <laughs> it happens. Uh, anywho, one night they were out exploring, her friends and her, and as they were walking, they heard music, and they noticed this small uh, torch-lit stone cabin, and of course, being curious, they went closer, and they could see people dancing inside. And she said that as they got closer and closer, they started to feel this really cold sensation, and she stuck her head through an open door of the cabin and she noticed that the people were in uh were dressed in like 17th century fashion so she started to uh enter the the room into and the one cabin. of her yeah into the cabin and one of her friends grabbed her and pulled her out and at this time half of her body instantly became paralyzed so like the half that basically the, the, the doorway. yeah the half that happened to be already through the doorway Hmm. So the doctor ran several other tests, and he couldn't find the cause but between, uh, behind the hemiplegic. Uh, the EEG didn't show that the left hemisphere of her brain did not show signs of normal um, functioning, mm -hmm. as well as uh, a normal amount of electric waves. So basically, and, it was showing that there was something... There was something abnormal in there. Right. And the writer on this site did mention that many Peruvians claim to have had an uh, unexplainable experiences in this uh, forest. And some say that you can even feel str a strange kind of energy when you visit this stone forest. Mm -hmm. uh, they said that this young woman, uh, upon uh, stepping halfway into that door, that she had entered into a dimensional doorway and when her friend pulled her out quickly it caused a disturbance within her own body's energy hmm. now according to this article the doctor said that this patient was still undergoing uh, physical rehabilitation in Lima's um, uh, oh what's the name of it um, Arzon Vispo um, Something hospital, anyway. Loeza National Hospital, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and that he couldn't find anything that would suggest some manner of trauma to have occurred to this young woman. Uh, he couldn't explain uh, what was causing her paralysis only to the, to the left hemisphere or the left side of her body, body and brain. Yeah. But according to this site, his story, he believed that when she stepped into that cabin... Uh, a partial entry 
that it had some effect to her nervous system. Right, kind of and changing stuff. Exactly, uh, changing the energy flow within her body. Now, the story is far lengthier, and we will post the link in description so you guys can read more in depth on what the doctor said. Mm -hmm. uh, the site also posed a question, uh, what would have happened if she had walked all the way in and her friend didn't pull her out? Right. You know, they... like, would she have gone into another time or another dimension? Right. And according to them, the cabin disappeared. Is this a true event? I don't know. But it was just one of the many stories that we did discover as we uh, searched the net. And when you mentioned Vortex, this story just came to mind. Right. Well, because that's what it felt like. It's like you just went on like some weird, you know, when I went on that bridge or even right before you, yeah, I approached that bridge, you know. And like right. I said, I don't even think I could find that road today or that same section, but... It was, it's something I'll never forget, and it was very bizarre. That's why we always, we always, when me and her ever bring it up or have that memory pop up, we'll be like, do you remember the, bright, you know, the Triangle Bridge? And we're just like, oh, my gosh, you know. But there's this one, um, um, uh, this book, okay. I was kind of like surfing, trying to find different things that we can kind of share besides the obvious, too, of what people talk about when it comes to urban legends and time travelers and stuff. And, right. um... There was this book I saw it was called um, Time Storms, and it, it's like a basically amazing evidence for time warps or space rifts and time traveling. And it's by this uh, this lady named um, Jenny Randalls. Now I haven't read the book yet, but it looks kind of interesting. But in this book, it, she was talking where she went and got all these different stories from around the world from people who supposedly had these different experiences <laughs> when it comes to these oddities. And she was also kind of putting down her theories and, and scientific type of things, you know. So it's kind of like a, a mixture of everything in this book. And um, she had mentioned one thing is that all the stories, they seem to have like one common element. And it was kind of like that strange energy cloud, which I know I've kind of read about in other things too. But it's basically right. she was saying like this, you know, all the things that she was gathering from around the world, listening to all these people having these experiences that they have like this they're always telling about this strange energy cloud that kind of transports people or things like into unknown dimensions and they're like these weird glowing clouds and she just the people are lab labeling them as time storms which I thought was kind of interesting and probably you know worth mentioning on tonight's show anyway for people who like to read random things of the unexplained and what have you be it fictional or real you know reality I just thought you know people might be interested in checking that out it's time storms by you know Jenny Randall's so well that's maybe that's what um oh, what's his name Sir Victor Goddard experienced a time storm uh, Sir Victor Goddard himself claims to have had an unexplained time trip caused by disturbances in the clouds right I got a picture of his too hold on let me see if I can get his picture up of that one too but yeah I got a picture of that um this I get. I know the story. The story, like of that guy. Well, he's interesting in himself. Yes, he Sir is. Sir Victor God Goddard, because he's had like a lot of weird, unexplainable things. But he's also very well known. Right. And I think he worked with. Um, what the heck was that president? When he came with the UFO stuff back in the day. Um, we talked about. I also my brain's going blank. But anyway, he worked with the UFO things. And at first, I want to say Truman. Yeah. Yes, yes, thank you. He wasn't first a believer, but then later on he became a believer. And there's like this photo that goes around too that's a famous photo where there's a ghost of one of the past soldiers that p appeared in the photo behind him. Oh, I know that photo. Yeah, so Sir Victor God Goddard, he's kind of around in a lot of things when it comes to the unexplainable, but I mean, supposedly he has this one, you know, and a lot of people know this when it comes to the urban legend stories, his, um, you know, Air Marshal Sir Robert Victor Goddard joined, you know, from what I saw, the Royal Navy when he was like 13 years old, which I can wow. imagine being 13 and joining in the military. And in 1918, it said that he transferred over to the <laughs> RAF. Well, during 1935, from what I was kind of reading and, you know, just trying to gather the right information, Sir Victor experienced this one explainable thing, and it kind of goes with that time storm stuff we were talking about and that you mentioned. Now, he was like the wing commander. Well, he was a wing commander or whatever, but at this time he was, 
he had like a little weekend getaway or something. So he climbed in the Hawker Hart biplane for the small weekend trip to Edinburgh, Scotland. And he was um, leaving like Andover, England base. Well, according to his accounts and what sites are saying on the net, because there's always a little variation, okay? But um, I guess the Sunday before he was going to fly back to his base, he decided to visit on the abandoned airfield in Dremen, which is near Edinburgh. Now, the airfield, um, from what he was saying, or was, not him, but what the net was saying, was it was constructed and used during the World War I, but since then it kind of just been left to the elements. So when he went to visit, he basically saw like, uh, you know, four hangars, um, a beat up, you know, tarmac strip that, you know, just yeah. was in poor condition, you know, grass and all that stuff kind of going through. And, and it, from that, when he was there, it was basically all the fields were, at that time for the airfield were basically stripped off and with fences around him, barbed fences, you know, for the cattle. And there was like a farm and stuff. So they were all kind of like sectioned off and stuff. So it wasn't really a being used um base you know anyway so the next day supposedly he left you know and went to to go fly back to his england in back to andover england you know and um he was in like i said that hawker heart biplane which is like an open cockpit type of plane and i i don't know if this is the exact version because they had a couple variations back then so i just picked this one and and maybe close to the one he was flying but it said during his flight that you know, hit the weather just started to become really dark and ominous, and this all the clouds just were hanging really low, and it was raining. And it was just like a nasty conditions, and being that he was already exposed to elements, so he was just having rain pouring down on his head and on his goggles and everything. So, of course, he like any pilot would try to you know get out of the weather. So what do they do? They go above the storm. Well, he was climbing above the clouds as far as you know to try to get to out above the storm. And he had about 8,000 feet, at which time if there was still no uh, clearing. So at that point, his plane started to um, spiral downward, and he was fighting with the controls, you know, and he couldn't pull it out of the spin. All he could do was, like, basically speed up or slow down, according to his words, and he just couldn't get out of the spin. And he wasn't really actually aware of that exact position of where he was. He just knew that he was going to hit the ga- ground at some time soon enough. Well, he said the storm clouds begin to turn like this yellowish brown, you know, like I was talking about that glowing weird coloring stuff. Right. And then at, according to the sights and what he was saying, he was just about a couple hundred feet. And then he finally emerged from the clouds. And then over, um, he kind of just pulled himself up a little bit and he was over this rotating type of water. And then in front of him, he saw like this stone sea wall with like a road with railings on top and he said that the road seemed to be rotating from like left to right as this cloud cover hanging that he was with was about you know 40 feet and um so I guess from what people were saying and what he he was saying he was about 20 feet just above the ground before he could finally pull his plane out of the spin and just leveled it off well he just barely cleared this seawall and as he was flying over the stony beach and stuff in the fog and rain, you know, he kind of finally recognized this road in front of him and he knew that it would head to Edinburgh so, <coughs> and it would he- bring him back towards that Dremel field. Well, when he was heading in that direction, this all of a sudden, he said, the sky instantly became really clear and bright with sunlight. And as he approached the airfield, the, um, the storm basically disappeared, and he could see the hangars and the tarmac were, you know, like brand new. He said at one point on one side, there was like four bright yellow planes lined up at the end of the tarmac, and there were three of them were like the AVRO uh, 504N trainer biplanes, and then he said he saw another plane, which is like this monoplane, which was like an unknown type, and that he didn't recognize because they didn't use that kind of planes in 1935 let alone were any of the planes yellow. And as he was flying over, he could see the airfield mechanics were wearing blue overalls working below. And at that time, in 35, I guess they only wore like brown khaki colors. They didn't wear blue when they were working in hangars and on the planes and stuff. And the planes um, weren't yellow back then. They were silver, like the silver aluminum type of color. You know what I mean? Right. Natural. And I guess as he was flying over, 
he was only like a few feet above the airfield, just enough to clear the hangar. So everybody who was down below should have seen him or should have seemed affected by his plane being so low and buzzing right over, but they didn't take notice. And as he flew over the airfield and crossed right over it, that's when all of again, he was thrusted back into that storm. And, you know, he was battling against the elements again. And at one point he finally climbed about to 18,000 feet or something. That's what he was saying in his book and stuff. And he finally managed to fly his plane and landed back at the Andover base. And when he landed, he was kind of, you know, just like com- in- baffled by what he experienced. And he did tell a I couple bet. of a few airmen of his experiences, but they just thought he was drunk. So he just kept quiet for like a long time. Well, I guess it wasn't until 1939 is when um, the RAF trainers began to paint their planes yellow and the mechanics did switch over to blue over uh, coveralls. And um, they did start to train with that new monoplane. I think it was like a mile makester or something it was called. I'm not sure. It was just something that one of the sites was saying. But um, he did eventually four years later go find himself in that same area. So he did go visit the drum um, air field or whatever you want to call it and he everything he saw was the same thing that he experienced that day through that odd storm you know there were yellow planes and it was all cleaned so up so apparently was, he was instead of going back in time he was uh shot into future yeah he like he had a the glimpse future. yeah he went through like a time glimpse or something you know like a time right just like a rip in the reality. I didn't. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I was listening to what you were saying, and it just uh, normally uh, it didn't seem. Uh, normally, when you hear about people um, going through time slips, it's usually back in time. But this gentleman actually went forward in time. So he claims, but he did have right. an experience where he saw this thing that went the day before he went. The whole place is dilapidated. It's not being used. It's a farm pasture, basically. And then, you know, the next day he's flying back to base because his, you know, weekend vacay part off, you know, time off is done or whatever. Then he's flying back. He goes to this odd storm. You have the yellow weird uh, clouds again. And then it busts into a sunny day and he's flying over the field and it's like perfect. It's been brand new. There's extra hangers. The planes are yellow. The people are wearing blue uh, coveralls and none of that matched right. for the time of 35 but then four right. years later when he found himself to be in the same area he decided to visit this base and that's when he noticed it exactly is what he experienced you know so it was you know he debated over how he could experience that and then at one point you know in his life after thinking about all this stuff in 1975 he wrote a book and it was called flight towards reality and um He was, you know, basically explained somehow he flown four years into the future for a brief moment before slipping back into his own time reality. But that's not the only weird thing he's had, you know. Right. I mean, this man has had several unexplainable um, experiences, um, not only with um, with time slips, but uh, paranormal and other unexplainable things. But uh, Sir Victor Goddard wasn't the only one to have experienced a time slip while in a plane. Uh, There have been others uh, just as recently as the 1970s. Um, In 1970, a Bruce Gernon, excuse me, he claimed to have flown into a strange cloud on a flight from Andros Island to Palm Beach. That was a, uh, that was a, like a 30 mile diameter donut shaped before transforming into a tunnel. Mm -hmm. And he claimed to have made the uh, the flight, which was a distance of 250 miles in 47 minutes. And he later began calling this strange cloud uh, electronic fog. Right, I remember that, I think I've seen his story like when I was younger, uh, like on the Unsolved Mysteries and stuff. Because they were having, he was on one of the shows and stuff, and they, um, the way he explained it and stuff, and he said he was fighting this thing and he couldn't get out of it or anything, and right. it just kind of sucked him in. And the next thing you know, he was right, basically in his destination. <clears throat> as I think you said, forty-seven. Well, minutes. even over the Bermuda Triangle, you know, there were uh, uh, military planes that claimed to have, you know, were flying along, and all of a sudden they were in this t- this cloud tunnel. Time storm, um, weird. 
thing. Yeah, yeah really. And then you also got that story of uh, the man from uh, Tarid. Right. I just want to say we're sharing the, the title of our show is called Urban Legends. You know, so we're not saying what we're saying is reality right. or, or fictional. We're just throwing things out there. You know what I mean? We're not trying to say like, oh, everything we're saying is true. And you know what I mean? But some of the stories we're going to say tonight or well-known fictional stories and some things that we're going to say are are people's like, real people like us like all of us anybody who's listening in chat and everything who's had an odd experience and you just can't explain it you know what i mean right so, and there and there are many many people out there that have claimed to have slipped into these time slips or these time storms you right. know and and we're not saying these are true stories we are just saying these are people these are what people are claiming to have experienced right but we're also going to share some of the well known as far as i call it fictional ones yeah. because the title of the show is called urban legends of time travelers exactly so we're trying to get exactly. a little mixture in there and stuff but um what did you say the man from Tord. oh yeah that's Tord. the other yeah that's another another one that people are always talking about and I think I got a picture of that. I made a picture up for it, so I'll just give people visual while they're watching. Um, I don't know. This man, supposedly the story of this man from another country that didn't exist, you know. But the all the stories and all the, the sites and everything, they basically are all saying the same thing. They're saying, like, sometime in 1954, I think it was, like, summertime, like, July or something, in Tokyo in at the... Um, I don't. What was that airport called again? Han, Handa Airport. I think or it's Han, Han Hanida. Okay. Anyway, I think. so it was like in '54 in July and stuff, and you know everybody's you know exiting their European plane and they're standing in line, you know, trying to make their way through customs and stuff. And this, you know, average middle-aged Caucasian man dressed in his suit steps forward in line, just you know, normal like everybody else. But for whatever reason, you know, a few officials decided to ask him some questions and of course the typical questions like you know why he was there or you know how long his stay is and of course he's telling the, the, the officials well he's here on a business trip and you know it's just been one of many that he's already done this year to Japan and you know they were saying that this man's native language was French but he also spoke Japanese and several other languages fluently now for whatever reason this man caught attention of some of these officials, so they begin to question him a bit more, because it's a 54, it's not like how it is now, you know what I mean? Right. So, they begin to ask him, you know, like I said, where he's from, and the man told him he was from that tour, and of course, they were not formally, you know, they didn't know that, that name, or didn't really recognize it, so they begin to ask him more questions, and he, this man, he didn't, you know, from what the stories are saying, he didn't really feel nervous or he didn't really feel bothered by them asking these questions. He just thought it was a typical custom type of thing. You know, you go through different countries. Right. Obviously, he's been traveling for business for a while and doing these things. You know what I mean? So right. he's like, yeah, I have no problem answering. He happily answered their questions and stuff. And he told them where he was from. And he said he was from um, Tour or whatever. And it was this nation situated between, like, France and Spain. And, you know, it's been around for about... I don't know, well over a, mil a millennium or whatever. And at which point, you know, one of the officials basically is like, I call, him, I call BS, you know what I mean, on this guy was what he was doing because he's from him He and a few other people, they're like, well, we've never heard of this place. It doesn't exist. And at which time, you know, the guy was kind of getting agitated a little bit, you know, so he hands over his passport and he hands, you know, when he gives him their driver's license and stuff. And, and, and um, I think he handed over like his bank check a book and everything and he's trying to show him saying you know here look at my passport I got all these visa stamps you know right. showing my business travels to Japan and other countries and where he's from you know and they still don't believe him and you know he's you know getting a little agitated a little bit and so he pulled like I said he pulls out his wallet and he's showing them currency from different nations he's showing him his checkbook of this bank name and you know he's like here's the name of my company and this is the company I'm coming to meet here, and I have a meeting at such and such time. This is the hotel where I have this, you know, reservation with. So, of course, the officials, you know, they called and checked the bit, the company, and they said, we don't know the name of this business. We have no meeting with this guy. The hotel reservation didn't ever exist for this guy. Um, you know, so basically, like, we don't know what you're talking about. His company or anything and you know they do a little more checking and stuff and as 
time went on, you know, because they got to figure out who he is before they let him in. You know what I mean? Right. So they're checking everything else. They go, and, well, we got his bank and his driver's license, so we'll check this stuff out. And they're like, well, this bank doesn't even exist, nor there, and so obviously there's no account, you know. So at this point, this man's frustrated and, and you know, like, with the blank, like anybody would be if they're being detained and being basically right. told you're a liar, you know. So this one guy's like, okay, fine, well, I'll pull out a map, and you show us where you're from. Well, he pointed to this region of um, Andorra, whatever I think it was called, and he was kind of confused and upset because he said, that's not indoor, that's Torrid or whatever it's called, you know. And they're just like, um, no, there's no such place there. This place has always been there. And at this point, of course, they couldn't allow him to go through the customs and to go on into the country because everything's not adding up. You know, he's got, right. basically to them, he's got a fake passport driver's license, weird currency, the bank never existed, this company doesn't know him, there's no hotel, whatever, so they're like, listen, we need you to spend the night, and we need to do a little bit more researching, so we're going to have, escort you to this hotel, you know, we need you to spend the night, whatever, and then we're going to have you come back, and we're going to figure all this out, so the guy's like, fine, whatever, so they bring him to this hotel, and um, of course, they're going to have a couple guards hang out, because they got to keep an eye on him, because they don't know if he's a terrorist or whatever. It's 1954. It's kind of weird. Everything that's going on doesn't add up, you know. So the two guards stay out overnight while this guy's in the room, you know, and the other investigators or whoever, they come the next day to come and get him to bring him back to the airport so they can clear things up and have him go his way one way or the other. So, um, so the next day, you know, they come to the door, they knock on the door, and nobody answers and stuff, and they knock again, nobody answers, so they go and get somebody to open the door, and there's no trace of this man at all. Well, he was like, they're like confused because the guards were like, we've been out here all night. There's no way. We haven't heard anything. There's no movement or anything. And the only way that they, the guy could get out, supposedly, according to these sites and the story that's been written out books and magazines and stuff, is like he could either get out through the door or he had to go out the window. And he was on a higher level, so he would have fell to his death if he jumped out that way. But that's not like, I guess, the only thing that was weird because... Um, You know, when they went back, you know, because they went back to the office or whatever, trying to figure out all this stuff. They have all his driver's license. They have his hotel, um, not hotel, pa passport and all that stuff. You know what I'm talking about? They still right. had all his paperwork and everything else. Well, that was locked up in their customs office, and all of that stuff disappeared as well. So, of course, this is just kind of like a story. Like I said, it's been around for a while, you know, and we've seen it on many nights or net sites, you know what I mean? And it's been written about, like I said, in a few books during the 80s and the 90s. But there wasn't any actual documents for this story to be real or not. But I thought it makes for an interesting topic or banter because it goes with what we're talking tonight. Now, right. there are other stories out there about people moving about in time through these time storms or time slips or in between different realities. Now, some have mentioned that since both... Because like, when I was kind of reading stuff about all these things that we were talking about and then it comes to this story and stuff... This one guy happened to mention, and I thought it was kind of interesting. Now, he mentioned that since both this guy and his items were from a different energy or density, it would be why also his belongings disappeared at the same time that he disappeared. Like, maybe they were only allowed to this certain amount of time slip in here, and then once that time slipped, you know, whatever, then they both crossed back over to where they belonged. You know what I mean? Right. Well, I that's interesting. That's an interesting theory. I just thought, because um, there's, when you go read this stuff, there's, the comments I like to read on those sites are what the average people are talking about. And some people right. bring up some really fascinating things that make your brain kind of... Make you stop and think. Right. Or think in yeah. a direction you may have never even thought about, you know? Well, that isn't the only story, though, of people randomly appearing into different timelines. I mean, there was a story of a Spanish soldier who was a member of the uh, Filipino Guardia Civil during the 16th century who somehow found himself in uh, uh, Plaza Mayor, Mexico, I think it was uh, in October of 1593. Mm -hmm. That's almost 9,000 nautical miles away from Manila where he just was. Uh, he was confused and he told people but no one believed him. Mm -hmm. And he was put in jail by the by the Perez, and uh, but this soldier claimed that he was just resting on a wall, um, in the Philippines, and kicking suddenly, back. yeah, yeah, kicking back, resting on a wall, and he suddenly found himself there in Mexico, and he told them that uh, Governor um, 
General Damasorinus uh, was just killed by Chinese pirates. And according to the story, two months passed. This guy's in jail in for, like jail two, for months, two months. Yeah. Of course, back then, you know, it took a lot of time for news to get anywhere. If it did at and, all. Yeah. Um, and uh, a, a galleon brought news from the Philippines and told them that, yeah, all of what the Spanish soldier said did happen. And that they and that, actually, that governor was dead and everything, huh? Right, that that governor was dead and he was killed by Chinese pirates and and that also that this particular Spanish soldier that they had in jail was actually seen there on the 23rd. So the guy that came over and brought the news and everything, they're like, yes, everything he said is true. Yeah, but everything he said They were confused true. by him being in jail there for two months because they just saw him there on October 23rd, and there's no way. And on the 24th, he was arrested and put in jail in Mexico, 9,000 miles away. The very next day. You know, I mean, back then, what what did I say, what year that was, 1593? <laughs> 9,000 miles, you're talking about almost a month's worth of travel. Well, probably more. He was leaning on the wrong brick, I guess. Or I guess stone. He was. The stone. Could you imagine? Well, let alone I imagine because I had a weird experience, but I'm, I didn't go uh, as far as I believe anywhere. It's, it's ended up somewhere I shouldn't have been and ended up once I crossed over that bridge. But could you imagine, like, some of these stories that we're talking about now and then having that experience? I don't even know. Or even become half paralyzed. Stepping, you go, you're walking through the woods with your friends and then you see this, like, tucked away cabin. And it's lit by, you know, candlelight or whatever, fire. And then you hear music and, of course, you're intrigued. And then you walk up and you're like, well, wow, these people are really dressed to the nine for the 17th century. they, they got to be cool people if they're dressing up like I don't this know and if having I, a party, you know? Uh, yeah, really. I don't know if I would have tried to have walked into that place. But, you know, of course, then again, I probably would have. But I would have shoved you in and be like, you go first. Yeah, you would have. You'd been behind me. You first. Um, but, um... Um, and then becoming half paralyzed. Yeah, well, because she stepped that, halfway in, then your friend pulls right. her out, and then she's still being treated, and they can't explain to why, because she has no trauma or, you know, anything to show why she would have th that to happen. So now, I can't... Some of these things are interesting to think about. Is it true? Yeah. I mean, I don't know, but it's definitely I, interesting. I can to, believe this, like I said. I don't believe in time travel, but I can believe this. There's always the possibility... If, like, you if know, she had seen this... Uh, and and um, she was halfway in there. I could I could probably accept the fact that since she stepped into a different dimension or a time slip, that it did interfere with with the uh, with the nerve pulses and the electrical pulses well, and, and all of that to her body. Well, right. If everything's made up of energy and we're energy, right. energy. Then, that's the word I wanted. You know what I mean? So right. There's all so I, I can I can accept that theory that it just threw her energy and her and her nervous system on that side out of whack. Right, or fried it. You know what I mean? Yeah, or fried it. But, but there's so many things that we've we've heard stories of, or people created stories of, or people actually had odd experiences that they can't explain it. You've had weird experiences. I've had weird experiences. People in our chat have had weird experiences when it comes to a lot of things. And I always say this, he's like, just because we don't believe something because we haven't experienced or seen it or been told it to be true, you know, but if you had everybody in one room and everybody told their realities and their truths and it was real stuff, I think it would alter the whole everything, you know what I mean? But I right. always believe that there's always a possibility, you know what I mean? I'm never going to say not because there's people who didn't believe there would ever be airplanes. There's people who didn't believe there was going to be this or that, and then all of a sudden there's this stuff. Well, you know what that's I mean? true, and it's like I said, even though that I do not believe in time travel, does not does not mean that the possibility is not out there or that someday we will travel through time, you know. I mean, I just don't Or they believe. already are doing it, but, you know, but th it's like you don't know. We don't know. We don't have the answer. We don't just, know what's going like on Like I said, exactly. this is like a light version of talking about urban legends and what have you. But, you know, you're talking about that one soldier, and he's just randomly bouncing through. That goes with that other... I, I don't want to say that one Spanish soldier one, but it's probably more than likely just a fictional story, but that reminds me of that one Rudolph one uh, fence dude. Because his story, that story was always—that's a big popular one. It's always going around. 
with urban legends about uh, why don't we take a break right now and we'll get to Rudolph Fence when we get back oh you're right I'm we're almost into the second hour okay um for those of you who are listening over at our Ustream site, if you want, you can scroll down and find the link to our website and click on it and join in with some of the chatters and stuff. Um, we're going to take a quick three-minute break if you guys want to stand up, stretch, get something to drink or get some popcorn or whatever. And then we'll return and finish the second hour with the rest of these random stories and different theories and stuff when it comes to time travelers and stuff. So thank you for sticking with us and we'll be back in three minutes. With Spooky and Raven. I'm your host, Raven, and hopefully Spooky's back with us for the second yes, hour. Yes, I am. Show. You're not going to get rid of me that easy. I totally forgot about break because we're just randomly talking about all these things, and I didn't really. Sometimes the first hour just zips right by. I know, it realize. did. It just kind of zipped right by, didn't it? Yeah, it just pow. I'm like, oh my gosh, we're already almost into the second hour. But again, for those of you who are just tuning in or have been tuning in, thank you. But um, tonight is you know, urban legends about time travelers and we're sharing some stories we read about real people that they shared on forms and stuff of their experiences when it comes to weird dimensional slips or time slips. This is just going to be a light version on the topic, but later on we're going to have other shows dealing with time travel and get a little bit more serious in sharing a lot more right. other stories and, you know, with, you know, John, what's his name? 
Titan Teeter and David Anderson Titan and Teeter, all that yeah. stuff. Yeah. So, but um, I forgot what we were last talking about. Do you remember? Uh, Rudolph Fence. Oh yeah, because th- that dude that reminds me of this because you were talking about the soldier story, you know, right. which I seem to be sounds like it's fictional. Could it happen? Possibly. I mean, there's so many things that do happen. Right. But it made me think of that one story that's always going around when people type in time traveler. That's like one of the huge ones that always popped up. So, of course, we're going to well, say it because it goes with tonight's topic. So Exactly. Well, in June of 1950, this man suddenly appeared in Times Square, New York, in New York City. And the man appeared to be confused. And then suddenly, in a panic, he began to run and he was struck down by a car and died. Now, the man was wearing old-fashioned clothes, and he had these, uh, they're called mutton-chop sideburns, which by this time they had long been out of style, and he appeared I don't know. Be, I still see some men wear that. I, I think they're coming back, because I saw somebody just the other day with, with I don't those think they go sideburns. <laughs> somebody else is sporting not. that style. So. I know. Um, he appeared to be about 30 years old and his, uh, his body was taken to the morgue where his body and his clothes were examined. Now in his clothes, they found several items like a copper token for a beer worth five cents. That was cheap beer. I know. I'm like, beer Um, for five cents. Could you imagine? I know. Beer for five to cents. Oh my gosh. You could get drunk on 50 cents on a quarter. Taco night. (laughs) Yeah. Taco night. Uh, uh, this token had the name of a saloon, which no one, including the older residents there, had even heard of. Uh, there was a bill for the care of a horse and the washing of a carriage by a livery stable. Stable. <clears throat> Spit it out. I'll get this out. On, Don't make me smell uh, <laughs> On Lexington Avenue, but it was not listed in the phone book, and no one had even heard of it. There was about uh, $70 in old bank notes. There were business cards with the name Rudolph Fence and uh, with an address on Fifth Avenue. And there was a letter from Philadelphia that was sent to the Fifth Avenue address. And the letter was dated 1876. There was also a medal for a uh, third place in a three-legged race. I don't know why anybody would carry something like that around. Must have been a good luck charm. But all of these items appeared to be new with no signs of age. Now, at this time, a Captain Herbert Rim of the Missing Persons Department of the NYPD tried using these items to identify this man. He went to the address on Fifth Avenue, but there was there was a business there, and the current owner had never heard of Rudolph Fence, and it's spelled F-E-N-T-Z. I like how case. the story always grew over the internet. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know. Well, Mr. Fence was not listed in the phone book. His fingerprints were not recorded anywhere, um, and no one had reported him missing. Now, this Captain Rim continued his investigation, and he finally found the name of Rudolph Fence, Jr. in a 1939 phone book. Uh, The address turned out to be an apartment building, and when he went and questioned the residents, they found out that this Mr. Fence was around 60 years old, and he had moved away around 1940, but no one knew where. So Captain Rim contacted a local bank, and there he discovered that this 60-year-old Mr. Fence had died in 1945, but his widow was still alive, and she was living in Florida. So he contacted her, and she told him that her husband's father, who was 29 at the time, went out for an evening walk and disappeared without a trace. And all efforts to find him just failed. Hmm. So this Captain Rim checked the missing person files on Rudolph Fence from 1876. And his description, the clothes he was wearing at the time, his age, everything matched perfectly to this man found in Times Square. Now, Captain Rim marked this case unsolved because he was afraid that he would be thought of as mentally incompetent and he never noted his results in his official investigation files. 
And for decades, the story of Rudolph Fence was accepted as true and as proof of time travel, especially among Europe's paranormal community. Now, that was until 2005 when a researcher named Chris Aubeck investigated this story and found out that the story began as a science fiction story written by Jack fin uh, Finney and was published in 1951. Now, two years later, a writer by the name of Ralph Holland reprinted this story without permission. And he removed all indication that this story was, in fact, fiction. Now, at the time, Holland was a member of a group that promoted a belief in the existence of a fourth dimension, and the group was called Borderline. So, Holland's tale of this accidental time traveler made its way to Europe where it circulated like I said, within the European Paranormal Research com Community for decade decades as an example of a true and strange mystery. You're like me, having a hard time talking tonight. But it has to do with, well, we worked all day and stuff, everything else, like 10 hours and right. stuff. But, yeah, that's one of those popular fictional things. But for a lot of people still think that that's a real incident. You well, know I, I mean? remember a few years ago that I had read something about this guy. So when I came across his name, it was very familiar to me. Like well, yeah, I it's said, been around I'm... for like so yeah. long. Somebody wrote this up. And then of course the, the, the reality of internet is they, as someone's always going to oh, yeah. make everything grow and stuff. But there's people out there when they, cause who are interested in it when it comes to time travel. And I do find it interesting and stuff like that. But tonight's a lighter version. We're just throwing stuff out there. But this is definitely, you know, I don't know, it's fake. You know what I mean? It's all right. there shows that it's fake and stuff, but some people still want to believe that but this for, one but is true. But for decades, you know? though, I mean, literally for decades, this story circulated around as being true and as being proof of time travel. It's still being which, on YouTube and everything else. It's still being well, yeah, you can this still, is to this, real and this one's true. To this day, you can still find this story. As a matter of fact, when I was looking up. I think it's up, like the first one that popped up. Yeah, one of, it's one, one of, of the first. Yeah. Uh, but as I was doing research on, on ur you know, time traveling urban, urban legend legends, stuff. Yep. Mm -hmm. this story popped up. Hmm. And it popped up more than once. I went to... Uh, it's littered three, all maybe, over the internet. Yeah, yeah. I, I went to uh, two, three, maybe four websites on uh, true, uh, supposedly, uh, proof of time travel. And this story popped up every time. Right. We well, got people experiencing it who are just standing or walking. Okay, there's and there's that other that other fake one we always hear. I forgot what the guy's name was, but he's like the guy who walks. He's walking through this field, and everybody's seen him walking through this field, and then all of a sudden he just disappears. Yeah, right in front of everybody's eyes. Yeah, yeah you know exactly. And that's one of the other ones that's going on. But it's not just you know people walking or being on the street or leaning against the wall or. Um, being in planes and stuff there's also stories going on where people are you know on the net where or people are having these experiences or, or um odd time slips and, and it's taking place on roads when people are driving and yeah i was kind of looking around and stuff and of course this is the guy who's got he just reappeared like that one guy but he got hit you know by this car and that's a great story it's a it's a story you know and most of them are it's pretty hard to you know most of the things that you see when you type in you're going to get these fictional ones, but there are people out there who are writing their real experiences on forms and stuff. But, um, there was this one site I was kind of just, I was really trying to find some that maybe some people hadn't heard yet. You know what I mean? When it comes to telling yeah. these stories and what have you, but, um, there's this one story and some of you guys may have already heard it or whatever, or those who tune in later and listen to the podcast that this, you know, kind of took place in 1969 and, it was written by this um, Ken, I can't remember his last name, it's like Miox or something. I, I don't remember how to say it and I apologize. But it, this guy, he's like this writer and he published it in High Strangeness in um, the Strange Magazine in um, 1988. And he claims to have known and interviewed the people that were involved in this one incident. And I will post the link to this site too. You know, because we normally post all the links in the YouTube description so you guys can go read it up yourself and stuff. But 
According to him, interviewing these people on October 20th of 1969, um, these two men, I just forgot if I put the photo up or not, but yeah, these two men were having like this lunch in um, Abbeville, which is like southwest of Louisiana, and you know, they're having lunch and they're, you know, it was kind of like a business lunch, so they're kind of like conversing and whatnot, and one guy, he just wanted to use his initials, his name was LC, and his business associate, who didn't really want his name out there, and so we're just going to call him Charlie. But um, anyway, these two men, you know, they finished up their lunch and they were going to begin to drive north on Highway 167, heading back towards um, the oil, um, oil center city of Lafay, Lafat, or how do you say that name, that city in Louisiana? Um, Lafayette? Yeah, that's it. Sorry. Anyway, which was like 15 miles away or whatever. Anyway, so it was like around 1.30 and these men, as they were driving on... Um, that highway on 167 they spotted like this old turtle back type of um antique car traveling really slow ahead of them well as they approached closer both of the men were kind of commenting of like how awesome the condition of this car was for how old it was it was like perfect like it was just right off the floor you know and um lc he wasn't driving the other guy was driving and he had mentioned hey look at the plates it's like this bright orange plate and it just had stamped on it 1940 well of course in 1969 they had different license plates you know what i mean yeah so they were commenting and looking at that and talking about the car and how amazing condition this car was in and how it was just creeping so slow so they decided they were gonna pass it so as they came up on it, they started to um, pace this car side by side, and they were just kind of looking at it. And when they were looking at it, they noticed this young woman was dressed in 1940, um, like, vintage clothing. And she was, like, wearing this fur coat, and she had the cap with that long colored feather sticking out that they used to wear back then. And next to her, she had this child that was also wearing, like, this heavy coat and a cap. And her wind the windows of the car were rolled up, and as they were, you know, they basically were pacing this car at the same time because they were just kind of soaking it all in and soaking everybody in at the same time that why they were dressed this way, you know, how amazing this car condition was. And this woman turned and looked at the men and they could see that she was like totally freaking out. I mean, she had this fearful look on her face and she was kind of like looking back and forth at everything with this like lost, uh, like dazed and fearful look and like, you know, like helpless type of looking I'm talking about. Yeah. And she was looking over at their car and at them and just had this face, about, you know, like her face was getting white and stuff. And so he, they had their window open. So he kind of leaned out the window, LC did, and he, um, you know, was kind of like motioning to the woman and, and he was asking, do you need help? Do you need help? And she nodded her yet, her head yes. And as she, she was kind of looking down, because those cars back then were a little higher up than how our cars are nowadays. So she was looking down at their vehicle and looking at it and getting it like this really odd expression, like what the blank, you know, like, because obviously their car is from a different time period than what she's supposedly from. So she motioned for her to pull over her car to the side of the road, you know, kind of repeatedly until she caught on. So she agreed to pull over. So they passed her car as she was pulling off. And then they pulled off in front of her, and as the men stopped their car and they turned around, that antique car was completely gone. It was like an open highway. There was nowhere for her to just not be seen. And it was wow. just as though it just vanished. Now, both of these men kind of sat there for a moment, and they were kind of, like, confused, like, what happened? Where did her car go? And then all of a sudden, this other man pulls up in a different vehicle, and he comes up to these, these two men, and... um he's like he's like you know trying to talk to him and stuff and they hop out and he's like he's trying to explain to them what he he was driving behind them for a bit you know he was behind both of their cars the antique car and their car and he watched them um pacing this that car slowly side by side and as he approached them because they were both moving really slowly you know what i mean and he was getting closer and closer he said he saw her, um, that their car over, you know, go on the side and then go up in front of them. And then she, and then saw both of them pulling off. And he said that he saw her, that antique car just disappear right in front of his eyes. So wow. that's like three people that saw this car and they both saw it, you know, just vanish. So, um, they all got out and they were looking for a good hour searching the whole area, trying to figure out like 
you know, where is this lady? What happened to the car? They were looking for any kind of clues or any signs of this event. Did it occur? And then at one point, the one man who was uh, by himself, he said, well, we should contact the police. Well, this LC and this Charlie guy, they didn't want to contact the P uh, police because they couldn't, I mean, what are they going to do? I mean, you can't, lo how are they going to logically explain this event? They would be, you know, people would think they were nuts or something. So they're like, no, we're not going to contact, just going to go on our way or whatever. You know, so did this lady, you know, suddenly appear in their time reality and then, you know, right when she was pulling over, slip right back to her own time reality? So if she was from 1940 because the license plate was orange and said 1940, she would still be alive today, you know, so right. she could have told she her, could be. Yeah, she could have told, well, yeah, she could have told her experiences with the people that she knew if she returned back, if she returned back to her own time reality. You know what I mean? Is yeah. this story true or fictional? I don't know. But it was on this site where this guy claims that he knows these people. He's interviewed them. It's in a couple of magazines and stuff. Like I said, I'm going to put the link on in the YouTube description so you guys can go and investigate it even more and read the different articles and everything else too. But that's, you know, we're talking about cars and stuff like that. And this one, you know, I saw this one and I thought it was kind of interesting, you know. Because of, most of the time, it is a lot of people it would, on Sundays... It would kind of freak me out. Well, because sometimes you do see old cars and stuff, so, and they, they're not perfect. Like, they just rolled off the... the Assembly line? Yeah. So they yeah. were... The, of course, they're taking their time, and they rolled up to it, and they were really... You know, they were Well, I could understand why they wouldn't want to notify the police. I mean, what were they going to tell them? Well, we were behind this car, and it just suddenly just disappeared. Right. And then there's a third guy who came up and was seeing the same things. Right. So, I, thought I don't know. I thought it was an interesting one and worth sharing when it comes to urban legends and oh, yeah, time absolutely. travelers and what have you. So Well, there was this couple who was vacationing in France in uh, 1979. Mm -hmm. And they were driving along, you know, when they experienced this unexplainable event. Uh, according to this story that I read, uh, they were driving around looking for a place to stay for the night. And when they started to notice these odd signs that looked like the old fashioned type. So as you know, they continued to drive, they spotted a building and asked some men who were standing outside uh, that told them that a hotel was just right up the road away. So they headed up the road and they noticed that this um, old fashioned hotel so they walked inside the building and they noticed that it was made from very heavy wood and was very outdated with absolutely no modern conveniences. <laughs> Wait, now, <laughs> so they were just cruising around on vacation, right? Now, yeah, you in said France. it was in 79. So, 1979. Right, so I'm just going to get, I'm trying to get a visualization of the time period and stuff. So they're just, you know, going throughout the country roads and stuff and then they stop into this inn asking for directions and then they gave right. them directions to where this hotel was okay i'm sorry i just spaced out for a second i need to catch up with no what you were problem. saying well like i said you know they um they found this um hotel and it was very old-fashioned and and as i said before when they walked in they noticed that um it was made from very heavy wood and it was very outdated with absolutely no modern conveniences Personally, I wouldn't have stayed there. Uh, what? The rooms. Why? No way. No bathroom. Some I'm not running outside in the middle for, of the night some to people foreign pay country for to go that. to the bathroom. Some people pay for that experience, you know, well, top dollar for that. You know, in the building alone may have taken you in like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Well, then I'll knock, up, I'll knock up four walls and with a dirt floor and put a bunk in there and then charge people 150 a night to stay there. Um, also, the windows... <laughs> See, you're all about making money, and I'm, like, appreciating <laughs> um, structures and, and the, old The beauty stuff that, of it, I yeah, know. Yeah, that, that withstood years, you know? Yeah. Obviously, well, we have the... different <laughs> personalities. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, in the room, uh, the rooms had an old-fashioned uh, wooden latch for a lock, and the windows uh, just had shutters that were made of wood, but there was no glass. So when the couple woke up in the morning, they went down for breakfast and they were sitting at a table eating and these two, uh, um, oh, I don't know what they're called. French soldiers. French, so 
French soldiers. Thank you. Um, I think I don't know gendarmes or something. Gen yeah, gendarmes, something like that. Something like that. Yeah. Uh, they walked in. They were wearing these old-time caped uniforms. Now, the couple were intrigued, but they didn't really have, and they didn't really have any feelings of alarm. This and thought was interesting. Well, they're in an they old hotel, so maybe people dress too. that way for the the theme of the hotel. You know, so it, kind of like yeah, oh, right. It, it could have been. It could have been that. That that is a very logical thought. Um, but the couple asked directions to uh, Av Avignon. Mm -hmm. uh, from these people and they paid their bill which came to 19 francs now after traveling several weeks in Spain they decided on their way back that they were going to stop and and again stay at this cheap old-fashioned hotel well, so when they, they arrived, paid 19 francs wouldn't you yeah really well, really that some was, money somehow and it included breakfast so um, when they got back in theme uh, yeah, the theme of the a theme, a theme hotel yeah. only nineteen francs a night, and it includes breakfast. Shoot, yeah, I'd stay there too. Um, no, you wouldn't. You just said you wouldn't because they don't have indoor plumbing. <laughs> well, if they had indoor plumbing, I would. So anyway, um, yeah, you made me lose my train of thought. Oh, anyway, they so they're headed back. Right. And uh, they're going to they, go hit back hit that hotel. They're, they're going to go. They're going to go back and stay at this old-fashioned hotel Word. but when they arrived there the hotel was nowhere to be found and they knew they were in the right spot because they saw the same old-fashioned signs that they saw the first time mm -hmm. and they realized that the old hotel had just completely vanished without a trace and also uh, when they got uh, back home and developed the film from their camera the mm -hmm. photos that they had taken at this hotel did not develop and also, after doing a little research, they found out that these French men wore uniforms uh, that uh, were only worn prior to 1905. After 1905, these particular uniforms with the capes were not worn anymore. Uh, I, you know, I find it fascinating because it made me think of this other story i seen it on this tv show where these you know famous actors and actresses share their odd and unexplainable experiences and to me i don't like una over somebody who's on tv or movies or radio or anything else because to me we're all just equal we just have different pain type of jobs but it doesn't make anybody more more important than the next guy you know just right. because of you're well known or not but they were sharing some of the, I can't remember the guy's name, but they were traveling too, and they were staying in Europe, and, um, oh, I can't remember exactly where it was, so I apologize, guys. If I can remember it, I'll put it in the YouTube description, but they decided to go check out this old town that was nearby, and some people kind of warned them not to go there, but they did anyway, or, no, maybe they were going to the old town. They were just driving somewhere. I forgot. Anyway, they got lost because... They didn't know the areas of where they were, and then something happened to their car, so they started walking in a direction thinking, well, if we'll go, because they heard, I think they heard and or saw a church steeple, so they started walking in that direction, and when they got into this town, it was like everybody was dressed in, like, 1800s, early 1900s, drab, dark, you know, they didn't have color back then, really, you know what I mean? And right. they were all, like, zombie type of feel and they just and what ended up is like they ended up in this town where everybody was basically kind of like they were dead it just, they weren't in the same type of time period of what they were walking into and um they went to ask this one lady who was in front of this church for directions or a phone or something and when she pulled her hand up her head up and she pointed at them her face was you know I guess freaky looking and she had no eyes or whatever and then they just took off running back down the road back towards where they're broke down car was or whatever and then when they eventually got back to their hotel it turns out that that town indoor place doesn't even exist anymore and it only existed back early in the 1800s you know wow. so that rem that thing what you were telling me reminds me of that other type of time weird slip is it a spiritual paranormal thing or is it like a, the time rip to a different reality or what have you you know what I mean it's one of those things and I forgot what the guy's name is, but 
you know, I'll have to look it up and then I'll put, like I said, I'll put it in our YouTube description and stuff. But when you were telling this story, it made me think of that story of somebody else having another odd Well, it makes you, it, it kind of makes you wonder, you know, are, are people from the past having time slips into our time? Well, right. If, if, if it's even you know. possible, we don't know if everything's made up of energy, you know, and there's, right. and like I said, we, we all grow up to our own belief system of what we're brainwashed into or what we're experiencing, but there's other people who do have experiences and, you know, if we get everybody together and they share their experiences, it's going to alter everybody's reality. So, I mean, Probably. It, it may be possible. We don't mean you don't know, but there's people out there who are having these odd experiences. Now I've read, you know, cause we're speaking of time, you know, traveling and stuff. I read people's stories of their odd experiences on that about.com that I mentioned earlier. And there yeah. was this one story, um, that was shared by, one this lady's relative now her name was um eula white and her family lived in um royal um the rural alabama like in the 1920s or whatever so she was kind of like this young girl but one day in um the early morning her and some of the other women were, were sitting on the front porch of the hawkins farmhouse and they were getting ready to um you know shell several bushels of like peas and beans for preserving because that's what you, you did back then and um Mrs. Hawkins came, or Mr. Hawkins came out of the house onto the porch telling Mrs. Hawkins that he was heading um, to town on some business and he went proceeded to saddle his horse and to ride towards the big gate and that's when Mrs. Haw Hawkins asked him to bring home, you know, a sack of flour and of course he responded with the typical grunt and rode off, you know what I mean? Yeah, well, typical um, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, it was like mid-after, according to their, this woman's story um, that happened to her grandma, it was like mid-afternoon came around as they were still kind of working away at shelling and stuff and they noticed Mr. Hawkins was riding towards the house because the main road you know and their um road that go up to their farm you know connect and it was pretty you could see mm -hmm. it from the porch okay so it was about 300 feet away according to the site that I was reading in the story of Eula White of her real what happened to him anyway so he the road is right in front of the side of the women and the children and everything because they were Basically, the women and the older kids are working on the porch. The younger kids are playing in the, the, the grass, you know, in front of them because they don't do work. But they said that he started to ride up towards the gate, and um, they could see that he had, like, this um, sack of flour, like, just sitting in front of the, the part of the front saddle, you know. So yeah. he had the, And then he was carrying, like, a brown bag in, of whatever in his left arm as he rode up to the big gate. And he stopped and he waited for someone to open it. Well, one of the boys ran and opened the gate. And in front of everybody's view, him, Mr. Hawkins, and the horse just completely disappeared. And everybody just kind of stopped what they were doing. And they just sat there quietly for a moment. Because they were, like, really confused about what just occurred. And then some of them began to, you know, a lot of the kids and the younger people, they started to scream after a few minutes, you know, and kind of freaking out. So they ran up to the porch and... You know, after a while, the women got everybody to kind of calm down and stuff, but everybody just kind of looked at each other and kind of just stayed speechless, like, what just happened? So after a little bit, they just kind of, like, carried on with finishing shelling the peas and the beans to, you know, because you got to get done, you know what I mean? But most of the children, they didn't play in the yard anymore. They just stayed up on the porch huddling behind all the adults, just kind of freaked out. Well, not that... <clears throat> it's kind of <clears throat> odd behavior. You're husband disappears right in front of your eyes and his horse disappears and you just eventually go back to shelling peas well they don't know what to what are you going to do you know what i mean you don't have a car you don't have anything else you don't have the phone you, you don't walk out there and see if the flower at least was there no everything just disappeared so when she finally told one of the boys to go close the gate because you don't want the chickens and everything to get out of the fencing or whatever so according to the story okay a half an hour yeah. later there might be some things li left out. It was her, you know, granddaughter who was t typing the story up for her, the yeah. grandmother who told the story to them, okay? So sometimes okay. you can miss a, a, a couple, you know, speeding up the story or whatever, okay? Oh, that's true. Anyway, so Mrs. Hawkins made one of the, the boys close the gate and stuff, and a, a, according to the story, a half an hour later, they again see Mr. Hawkins riding toward the house with that sack laid out in front of his saddle and the brown bay in his left arm. And as he approached the gate, he stopped and waited. Now, everyone was kind of frozen 
in place staring at him and no one wanted to get up and open the gate. They just kept staring at him and he's sitting there, you know, getting agitated and he finally said, well, is somebody going to go open the gate for me? And eventually one of the adults went and opened the gate for him and then he came in and of course he didn't re-disappear or anything. He would, that was just, you know, he's back. But the story goes, as Mrs. Hawkins always said, that was the day that Mr. Hawkins arrived before he actually arrived. You know, wow. so... Is it one of those odd time slip things or is it a, a spirit thing? I don't know. But it's one of those things that people had written up when it comes to when you go to about.com, you type in time travel and there's all these people sharing their families or their experiences when it comes to odd time slips. I thought it was kind of interesting that it fit in here for It tonight. is interesting, but I don't know if I would uh, categor categorize that as time travel. I that's just, well, what would you yeah. categorize it as? He's went, and then he came before he came. You know what I mean? I don't know. Yeah. That's just what was typed in that section. Oh, I thought it was oh, kind exactly. of interesting. And I, it fits in a little bit with the oddities of, you know what I mean? So Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I understand that. Um, I did see this one story, which was more recently, and it was about a student who was uh, trapped in a time loop for eight years. Now, this is as recent as 2007. A 23-year-old British student was forced to drop out of university uh, because of chronic de deja vu. Now, he claimed it made him unable to lead a normal life, and according to the student, he stopped watching TV, reading newspapers and magazines, and even stopped listening to the radio because he believed he had seen it all before. And, by the way, deja vu is French for already seen. Now, details of his case were published in the Journal of Medical Case Reports, and according to the reports, the student first complained of symptoms of deja vu shortly after entering university. Now, early episodes lasted for only a few minutes, but some attacks were prolonged, and at times they were extremely prolonged. He told doctors that he was trapped in a time loop and he felt like he was reliving the, fat, the, the past. This sounds like Groundhog Day to me. Yeah, a little bit, don't it? Yeah, really. Uh, while well, we're on, talking about urban legends, so. That's true. Now, while on holiday uh, to a place that he had been to before, he reported feeling as though he had done the exact same things as he did before. And he found the experience so frightening that he returned to university, but the episodes became more intense. Now, they were not just unsettling feelings of familiar, uh, uh, familiarity. You can I can't out. speak tonight. It's okay. He said, he said that it felt like he was actually retrieving these experiences from memory and not just finding them familiar. Uh, that he had actually experienced the entire trip before. Well, he was there before. Hmm. Uh, anyway, now there is a real medical condition of chronic deja vu that is usually associated with seizures in the tempor temporal lobe of the brain known as tempor temporal lobe epilepsy. You're picking a lot of things you can't spit out tonight for what normally I know, you can. I just normally can't you seem can, to... but tonight you're just like, Bleh. I know. Tonight I'm just having a hard time spitting this out. Uh, it is also associated, though, with other neurological disorders such as Why dementia. Why do you say stuff like that when I'm taking a drink of water? I'm like, don't spit. <laughs> you know, you just say <laughs> random things, and I'm like, everybody always says something at the moment I'm taking a drink of water. Like, <laughs> Rusty did that to me earlier when he said something funny in one of the chats. But anyway, go on. Tonight um, I can make it without spitting water. Uh, uh, the man, I lost my train of thought there. Uh, the man underwent a brain scan, but it showed no signs of seizures or other neurological uh, conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, he also went underwent a psychological test to check his memory, but that failed to show any major issues uh, but this man did have a history of anxiety and particularly a fear of germs that would cause him to wash his hands frequently and to shower three or more times a day now his anxiety became worse when he entered university and it caused him to take a break from his studies 
Now, this is when he began to experience uh, deja vu. Now, when he returned to university, his episodes of deja vu became more intense. Hmm. And this led him to abandon his studies completely. Now, in 2008, he was referred to specialists for uh, the neurological test, which showed nothing, and, the, and also the psychological test. He was eventually treated with different medications. Well, of course, that's how they treat things. They don't know what they are. Well, and, they got to keep their money coming in, so they got to make well, it Well, exactly. Uh, in 2010, he was again assessed, and it and it was by this time, though, that, like I said earlier, that he had stopped watching TV, reading the newspapers, listening to the radio, and all that stuff. Uh, but there were no known causes for these episodes, which were usually uh, a side effect of epileptic seizures or dementia, but in this man's case, they seem to be associated with his extreme anxiety, which was causing a, a, what they would call a mistimed neural firing in the brain. Oh, they make up whatever. They don't know. Yeah, I know. Well, this shit. is only uh, a theory, stuff. and it's not proven because there's been no other, other known cases of deja vu in people who suffer from anxiety or panic attacks. And also the theory that mistimed firings of neurons uh, cause a glitch in processing the, uh, the um, yeah. incoming of information to the brain since a single case really cannot prove there is a link between deja vu and anxiety. More study is needed. But the, <laughs> that he is the, uh, the so-called first one, you know, uh, to have this case with uh, associated with anxiety. Well, everybody labels something that they don't know, and they create, and they have everybody has their own belief system, and and, and people right. who take certain studies are you're basically brainwashed to your mind. To well, like I said, that sounds that, that's thing, but yeah, to me that sounded more like uh, a re, uh, a rerun of Groundhog, well, Groundhog Day. Day. He was experiencing the same thing over and over again. So you're saying this right. guy kept experiencing the same thing over and over this again. This guy is doing the same thing, you know, but they're calling it deja vu. So like he was trapped in the same time. Yeah, he was sort of trapped in this time loop. He was experiencing these things over and over and over and it just finally got to him so bad that he couldn't even, if he's suffering from anxiety and he goes to university college whatever you want to call it and he's in with a crowd of people it seems to me that that could make the anxiety worse so if he instead okay, of better. here's my theory if you're constantly experiencing the same thing over and over again you know what i mean maybe you would think to try to do something different that you normally didn't do in order to try to get out of it exactly. or stop what's happening and how do you and, and then for all this guy knows he could be dead you know because what if you're you're you you're dead and you don't know that you're dead and you keep reliving the last moment of when you're alive kind of like a residual thing yeah it made me think of that you know what i mean well and not only that they had him on different kinds of medicines you know and who knows what the effects of those medicines are yeah. Uh, oh well. They, yeah. They treat anxiety with some powerful stuff, you know. And this mm -hmm. is in the two thousands. What did I say? It was about two thousand seven. You know. I mean, we're, we're talking we're talking pill pushers here. Well, there's you pill know, pushers. You know, psychologists. All the time. Yeah, psychologists. They push pills on you. You know, you got anxiety. Here's a pill. You can't sleep. Here's a pill. You can't wake up. Here's a pill. Well, they should ask you. What you know, kind you of can't food go to the bathroom. What, here's a pill. What's you your diet? You can't go to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. Here's another pill. Well, that's the whole. That's. Because it's a pharmaceutical industrial complex. Anyway, exactly. And, exactly. And so I'm kind of wondering things, about but... this. Yeah. Well, no. Well, like I said, most but of the things... But he could have very well have been experiencing, experiencing it, too. <clears throat> if it's true. I mean, if the it's internet. true. You know, we're talking about urban legends. But there are people out there who are typing up and, ex and sharing their experiences when it comes to oddities, unexplainable, and paranormal. And I guess you would probably... I don't know how you classify time slips or dimensional, different dimensional realities right. or even seeing them. But, you know, if everything's stacked up, if everything is, it, you would think that maybe they're stacked up on top of each other, layer upon layer upon layer. You know what I mean? And maybe yeah. there's those little times where you get that rift where you can be pulled into, into or see, you know? I don't know. 
you know, but I mean, when it comes to urban legend stuff, I mean, of course, we're doing our search on the net, and of course, we're always going to come across, everybody's, if you're always going to type in time travel, you're always going to come up with those sites where, like, we have proof that yeah, have time proof. travels. You know, they had all these photos throughout time, and, you know, lots of them, the, when you type in, you're going to see, well, this, the look like ce celebrities and stuff. And, you know, we did a show on doppelganger stuff, and, um, you know, we are talking about when it comes to DNA and lineage and yeah. and how certain, there's only so many um, variations of what you're going to have. So at some point throughout history, there is going to be somebody who's going to be practically looking darn like you. You know what I mean? Does that mean oh, that yeah. the celebrities of nowadays are time traveling or the they're so immor they're like vampires or whatever, you know what I mean? But yeah. there's all these things that you're going on and you see all these Like things. that one in Nicolas Cage. Was Nicolas Cage a vampire? No, he wasn't. Well, you don't know that. I mean, he could be a vampire drinking blood every day. I mean, what's that one guy who was drinking tiger blood? <laughs> what was that guy? I have no idea. No, he 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 was on Angry Men or something. Wasn't that that show? Or Three Men and a Half or Two Men and a Half? What was that guy? I name? don't remember. I quit watching that when Charlie Sheen left. That's his name, Charlie Sheen. He was the one who's drinking tiger blood. Really? Never mind, you missed the whole point of what I was talking about because your brain shut off when I was conversating with you. <laughs> Evidently I, I could tell did. I could felt the energy when you did that, so you shut down. <laughs> but anyway, what I'm trying to say is like when you type in time travel, when it comes to urban legend stuff, you're always gonna get this the all these sites and the YouTube and stuff. We have proof, we have videos and yeah. of all these time travels and stuff and all the look of like cel celebrities and there's um what's that other one? That nineteen forty one hipster one, remember? Oh yeah. I think oh, I got yeah. that photo, too. Um, okay, there's there's this photograph that has been, or I should say, it's still being circulated around the Internet that some people are claiming to be that of a time traveler. And this photograph is known as the Time Traveling Hipster. Uh, the photograph was taken in 1941 at the, I believe it was the South Fork Bridge in Canada. Now, Canada. the thing of it is, this photo has been proven to be real and has not been edited. This is a real photograph. And the photograph contains the image of a man who appears to be dressed too modern for the 1940s. Um, he's wearing a logo t-shirt. He's holding a small portable camera. He is wearing wraparound sunglasses, and mm -hmm. he appears to be wearing a hoodie. Now, at first glance, he just appears to be out of place. Now, as I said before, this photograph has been proven to be real. But the thing of it is, all these things this man has and is wearing were available in the 1940s. Um, the logo on his t-shirt is the logo of the Montreal Maroons which was a hockey team that played in the NFL from 1924 to 1938. And the camera that he's holding is most likely a Kodak, which was a very, which was a very popular camera through the years. And while some might say the camera he is holding is too small, Kodak did in fact make portable cameras that were available in the 1940s. Uh, hoodies were also available in the 1940s. And in fact, they have been around since the 1930s. But that looks like a wool sweater. Well, possibly. Wool sweater's been around since the 1800s. Uh, and last but not least, the glasses that he's wearing, these glasses with protective side guards were very much available in the 1940s, but not many people wore them. So as I said before, you know, at first glance, the man in the photograph may look out of place. Compared but to his, how the older people, there's like tons of older people Compared to the there. other people, because he is younger and he's probably more hip in his dress, but his appearance is not impossible for the 1940s. And it's more likely that he is just a man with a different sense of fashion rather than a time traveler. Well, older folks grew up you know, and they dressed more conservative and stuff during that time period and everything else, so it's normal. Yeah, and, but if you look at that photograph, he is standing around people who are older than him. There's very few uh, younger people there, and he would look out of place. 
but everything about him was absolutely possible for the 1940s. If anything, I'd be suspicious of this woman with her hat. She looks more like she's up to something. She's got her hand up here. She's tilting. She's blocking somebody from something. Yeah. yeah. And this late, this girl, you know, she's probably more dangerous. She's like, I'm going to steal that guy's camera. I mean, that's what it looks yeah. like, you know? But yeah. this does not look like a hoodie. This looks like one of those button sweat, uh, wool sweaters, you know? Yeah. And they, you know, they did have t-shirts and everything that you explained back then. And Kodak was inventing and, cameras And the thing of the it time. is, too, if you stand there and if you look at this, all the other men <clears throat> in this photograph are wearing suits. Well, this guy's this, right here. This is, young man just walked up there like he was... A young yeah. college student or anything else. But look at this guy's got basically the same handheld camera that he's holding. Even though I kind of blocked it and it's altered because we put a little green thing around it. So it would point out better for people who are watching. Yeah. But you're right. This is a very easily um, figured out that this guy is not exactly. a time traveler. When it comes exactly. to if, you know, there and, may and be the something out there. Is... But this doesn't make proof that there's time travel as far exactly. as this photo goes. And, and this photograph is still circulating. As proof. On, on the internet as as proof of time travel. And there, and like I said before, he just happens to be dressed different from everybody else. He is a tall man. He's younger than the other people standing around him. And there is nothing about him that was not possible for the 1940s. Exactly. and always... even, even, even that <clears throat> scraggly hair that, needs, that badly needs combed. It's not scraggly, it's just wavy. He's just got a little bit longer than, you know, this guy might have... It makes me wonder, though, with everybody else in suits and the way he's dressed, it makes me wonder if <laughs> if he was uh, uh, poor or, or a... Maybe he wasn't poor, maybe he was just visiting. A traveler or, or just casual. Everybody has their own dress, you know, exactly. and nobody's freaking out the way that he's dressed, and everything that and you that's explained else was too. around Nobody... that time period... That's true. Nobody in this photograph seems to be alarmed by this gentleman. Well, no, because everybody, you know, like you said, it's easily to research up this stuff, you know, and right, you know, we like exactly. to, to dig through stuff and figure out and fil filters, filter, filters, you know, I love to put filters on and you can learn from negative or positive, you know what I mean? And right. there's a lot of things out there, but it's like, I don't really believe everything that's just but I just do not believe this is a time traveler. Because, like I said, well, everything Moose about said him. Well, he's wearing the MTV t-shirt on, but he's not. He's wearing, what did you say, a hockey t-shirt. It's a, it, The logo is from a hockey team that called was... the Montreal Maroons. Um, the next one, because we're talking about videos and photos that are circling around on the Internet of, hey, this is proof that all this stuff exists, you know, but... Everybody knows the, you know, famous video clip from the Charlie Chaplin film, you oh, know, yeah. the circus and you can, where you can see this shot, um, is from the film's premiere of, um, what was that Chinese theater again? The Grauman? Um, Grauman's Chinese theater. Yeah. Well, this is like in 1928 and it's the one on the right. Okay. Not the left photo, the one on the right. Now the one on the right, you can see this woman's holding something up to her face and she's talking away. And when you watch the video, you know, you can see this woman's holding it and she's talking it and there's nobody around her and whatever. Now, a lot of people claim it to be some type of cell phone device from the future and that she was a time traveler caught on film. Now, I do have to admit that it's very odd, right, when you watch this video. I think almost everybody's kind of seen it. And I do know that they did have these, like, hearing aid devices that look similar to what she's holding in her hand. But when you watch the clips, you can clearly see that she's holding a conversation and there's no one near her, you know, when she's conversating. She's by herself. All these people are walking past her. Nobody's paying attention to her. And it's almost like she's in her own little world, unaware of her surroundings as she's walking and talking into this, like, unknown device. Now, the thing is, there's this also another film, which is the one on the left from 1938, showing another woman holding a similar object to her ear as well, leaving the DuPont factory. Now, people claim that this woman, too, was a time traveler. But after, you know, me doing a little reading, some of the comments, and doing some searching on the net, I found out that there were portable phones back in that day, both in 1938 and in 1928. Now, one of them was invented by a Charles Adlin, I think his name was. 
if I said it right. And then another one was being designed by the DuPont for the U.S. Navy, and there were prototypes out there that were being used during World War II. Now, I think you can go and look up these documents because they're basically been declassified now for over 20-some years. Now, someone said that the young woman on the left, the woman that was in the 1938 film when she was leaving the DuPont factory, that she was actually 17, and she was interviewed, and you can search and find, I guess, this interview on the net. But her name was like a group... Or Gertrude Jones or whatever and from what these people were saying was they were testing these wireless communication devices and her and five other women were given these wireless phones to test out for a week and she was talking to one of the other scientists holding another wireless phone that was you know somewhere off to her right as she was walking by in this film now I've uh, I've seen that film and one of the things that I found very interesting about it is that she's walking out of that factory talking on that phone and no one notices or nobody cares because or nobody cared right now and, and you would think that there would be a lot of interest in that since that was such a new device back then right and you know I'll zoom up on the photos a little bit here uh, in a little bit but I'm gonna keep finishing off what I'm saying and stuff you know but um anyway she what, there was a okay there was one invented by the Charles Allen like I was telling his name Charles E Adlin and it was claimed that on April 29th of 1906, in the issue of New York World, that he had invented a device called the Vest Pocket Telephone. And although Adlin never had the chance to produce this device in like mass large quantities like we have nowadays, there were some out there for people to use. Now this wireless telephone, it fit into the you know pockets of people's vests and it was attached to like this little wireless battery that was um, used by the Marconi system, I think it was. I can't remember. But it could catch, like, conversations that were carried, like, along ordinary telephone wires. And depending on the energy that was um, behind each telephone, really depended uh, on the distance that you would get from sending and or receiving messages. And from one of the articles, it mentioned that um, one of the phones had went um, three miles off. So wow. I will post the links so you guys can actually read these newspaper articles from back in 1906 and everything and read about Charles and his invention about the vest pocket telephone that already been made and people were using it and it was just running off regular telephone wires and stuff just like they had for telegrams and everything else. But, you know, other phones came out later. You know, they also had that car phone and stuff and that came out you know, from the Bell System Mobile Telephone Service, they made that in St. Louis, Missouri, and they also did it in Illinois, you know, and they were like radio telephone services, you know, and people were using that, except for those a little bit bigger, and they were a little heavier, but there was for the car yeah. ones, and they ran off of like vacuum tubes and relays and stuff like that, but the DuPont factory and this other guy, Charles E. Adlin, they already invented these wireless phones that were small like these little cell phones that ran off these wireless batteries and you could connect right up to the telephone wires and he was saying that he would he it was basically like a party line you could pick up and hear everybody's conversations and happen and talk to people you know what i mean so maybe this lady who was in that 19 um what was it 38 or 28 i can't remember what it was anyway that 1928 that film and stuff maybe she had one of his vest pocket telephone pro because they had he had some made he didn't have the mass production like we have nowadays but there were people out there who were using these devices back then so i don't think she was a time traveler she could have just been one of those people who had one of these prototypes that were being produced back then and people can go and research and look back i mean that's the great thing about google is because if you really want to know if you know and figure things out you just have to do a little work and you're going to figure these there are things that are out there that we weren't even aware of because people were like oh no cell phones and all these things they weren't invented till like what the late 70s early 80s and they were like these big honky like sucky things you know what i mean but they had invented and were doing all these different things back in the day and it's just people are unaware of it because you're not being taught it or told it or know anybody who knew the information and that's the great thing about the internet you get to find all these things out because it's all at the tip of your fingertips you know but they did have um in 1924 the Siemens they did make these you know pocket size type of amplifier devices to help with hearing and stuff but in those films both of those women are talking and walking you know so yeah. 
they're and nobody's like even bothered by what they're doing so i don't think they're time travelers i just think they're people who are using these prototypes or these um wireless phones that they did have back then and you guys can go and find out and look it up look up charles adlan and the dupont and the declassified uh, paperwork and stuff like that because they were using it during the war and if something's classified the government ain't going to tell you what they have and stuff and then they're like okay if they already had this then why are we why did it take them so long for to, for the companies to perfect us to have you know how come we had these big chunky phones and they had little ones well guess what you don't get to have the same technology that the government gets to use or other people you know what I well, mean well when when uh cordless phones first came out um they would pick up um, conversations from our uh, people with what they call landlines that had regular telephones mm -hmm. could actually hear the conversations going on on the cordless phones and there were a lot of people that they would hear things on these phones and get suspicious and they'd call the police saying that their neighbors were plotting something or whatever oh my God. so they weren't quite perfected back then right but like I said, you can go look these things up. You know, I was curious, so I'm like, okay, well, was there something, you know, is, you know, because the video and the, these films and stuff, they are auspicious, and, you you know, you do a little researching, and you find out that they had these things invented back then. They just weren't mass-produced for everybody to have like we have nowadays, but they were there, and they did exist, and this guy did exist, and he's in newspapers, and, and all over the place, you know, so... You can look it up and read about it, but like I said, we'll put the the links in all the YouTube description, so you guys you don't have to do all the work. We'll just have it right there for you. But, um, you know, that's just a couple of things that when I was looking into this, because that's one of the things that pop in, pop up when you type in time travelers. You know, that's you know these ones definitely come up. You know, so right. And you know, uh, if time travel really did. Or does exist you know if I could travel time through time and you know go I'd probably go to the future you remember that one movie like back to the future too and then they were getting all those winning lottery numbers or the games oh, yeah. and everything and stuff yeah. if you could time you know travel through time why wouldn't you go to the future get that information come back and then just get like super rich I mean not just be talking to like interesting people from the past like Tesla Jesus you know Gandhi whoever you want to talk to you know what I mean? But why not go to the future, get some information, and come back and just make millions? You know? Really, I'd go. I'd I, I'd 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 go to the future and get the winning lottery numbers. Is what I would do. Uh, but that reminds me of this one story I read on the net about well, this. To, yeah, you have to kind of speed through it a little bit. You know. Right. We are going to run a little bit over, and this is going to be our last story. Uh, but like I said, it reminds me of this one story I read on the on the net about this time traveler that oh, was busted. Oh, I forgot to show that guy's picture. Wait, before you go over, here, I forgot. I got a little of the newspaper clippings. It shows this guy, the Adlin inventor, the vest pocket telephone. You know, 1906 in New York World, and it talks about he invented a telephone that could be carried in your pocket. So it's all out there. You know, I found this stuff. I just forgot to show it while we were talking. So I apologize for not switching through the picture. Just I forgot. It's a long night. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, this article appeared on March 19th in 2003 in the Weekly World News. Time traveler busted for insider trading. And I'm going to read the article for you real quick. It was uh, written by uh, a Chad uh, Colson. And like I said, it, it appeared on March 19th, 2003. Uh, New York, federal investigators have arrested an Ignat... Ign enigmatic Wall Street whiz on insider trading charges and incredibly he claims to be a time traveler from the year 2256. Sources at the Security and Exchange Commission confirm that 44 year old Andrew Carlson offered the bizarre explanation for his uncanny success in the stock market after being led off in handcuffs on January 28th. We don't believe this guy's story. He's either a lunatic or a pathological liar says an SEC insider. But the fact is, with an initial investment of only $800, in two weeks' time, he had a portfolio valued at over $350 million. Now, every trade he made capitalized on unexpected business developments, which simply cannot be pure luck. 
The only way he could pull it off is with illegal inside information. He's going to sit in a jail cell on Rikers Island until he agrees to give up his sources. The past year of nose, nose diving stock prices has left most investors crying in their beer. So when Carlson made a flurry of 126 high risk trades and came out the winner every time it raised the eyebrows of Wall Street watchdogs. If a company stock rose due to a merger or technological breakthrough that was supposed to be secret. Mr. Carlson somehow knew about it in advance, says the SEC source. Mm -hmm. um, uh, says the SEC source close to the hush hush ongoing investigation. When investigators hauled Carlson in for questioning, they got more than they bargained for. A mind boggling four hour confession. Four hours? Carlson, four Jesus. hours. <clears throat> I mean, and he stuck to his story. All right. Mm -hmm. um, Carlson declared that he had traveled back in time for over 200 years in the future. When it is common knowledge that our era experienced one of the worst stock plunges in history, yet anyone armed with knowledge of the handful of stocks destined to go through the roof could make a fortune. It was just too tempting to resist, Carlson allegedly said in his videotape confession. I, wonder I had planned to make... Tape. Yeah, videotape. I had planned to make it look natural, uh, you know, lose a little here and there so it doesn't look too perfect, but I just got caught up in the moment. In a bid for leniency, Carlson had reportedly offered to divulge historical facts such as the whereabouts of Osama bin Laden and a cure for AIDS. All he wants is, he that'd be useful, all he wants is to be allowed to return to the future in his time craft. However, he refuses to reveal the location of the machine or discuss how it works, supposedly out of fear the technology could fall into the wrong hands. He, he hid it in um, uh, urban development that wasn't quite developed yet, hidden behind a bush. There you go. Like, uh, back officials, to the <laughs> officials are quite confident the time traveler's claims are bogus, yet the SEC source admits no one can find any record of any Andrew Carlson existing anywhere before December of 2002. That's the end of the article. Now, we all know that the wor wor Weekly World News, I'll spit it out here in a second, is an entertainment tabloid that is devoted to inventing fantastic stories that are mostly fictitious. And in my opinion, anyone who reads the Weekly World News cannot take any of the stories seriously. Unfortunately, though, Yahoo reprinted the story in its TV news section under entertainment news and gossip, and they either did not know the story originated in the Weekly World News, or they did not know who the Weekly World News was, which I find that a little bit hard to believe. And they did not post any warning for their millions of readers that the story might be bogus. So the story was soon showing up in a variety of magazines and newspapers. Well, how are you going to make money? You've got to throw things like out there that's going to attract people in, you know? Well, yeah, but a lot, millions of people get their news off of the Internet, you know? And one of those, one of the more uh, popular places to get their news is Yahoo. Now, and, and then all of a sudden... You know, like I said, the story was showing up in a variety of magazines and newspapers, and as a result of that, the U.S. Uh, Security Exchange Commission was flooded with calls from journalists. So this spokesperson for the SEC says that the story is pure fantasy with no truth to it at all. Even if it was a reality, you think they're going to tell people about this stuff? Well, of course not. But... But the Weekly World News did do a follow-up article in their April 29th, uh, 2003 issue, and this article revealed that Andrew Carlson was bailed out by an unknown benefactor for a million dollars, but Mr. Carlson jumped bail before his April 3rd court hearing and disappeared without a trace. So maybe he went back to his planet. Who knows? Well... It makes for an interesting thing, and it goes with, you know, we kind of covered a little bit of everything. You had the airplanes, you had people randomly just being out and about, you had cars, you know, and 
I mean, can't remember everything we talked about, but there's a little <laughs> bit of everything going on where people, and some of the stuff you know it's fictional what we read well, because it's well it known ones. But you know the one with the cell phone videos and the the photo of the hipster they're they're easily debunked because right. there was pocket size phones invented in the early 1900s and you guys can go and google search it up and i'll put all the links up for you guys to go do a little bit deeper and stuff but there are when it comes to time travel and stuff there are shows that i'm going to want to do we're going on a little bit more serious you know what i mean right and this is just one we want to do a little bit on the lighter version when it comes to it and just kind of have like a light yeah, fun now, show. now some of some of these stories we covered tonight, you can absolutely tell that they're bogus BS. or yeah. or or the figment of someone's imagination. But yeah. there are some in here that even I have to admit to that are, are possible, that, that are intriguing and may have some truth to them. Well, right. And then I shared mine. I don't know how to explain it, but it kind of fits in with a time slip or time oddity. You know what I mean? Exactly. And, which was at the beginning of the show. So, it's like, I know there's odd things that occur to everybody. You know what I mean? So, I'm not going to to say that time travel isn't possible, and I'm not going to say that it is. I don't know. But to me, there's always a possibility for everything, just because of all these people that I've gotten to know and I've met who's had all these multitude of experiences when it comes to things where people said this isn't real, can never happen, it doesn't exist, but yet all these things are happening to all these people, you know? Yeah, so exactly. So maybe at, in some reality and or future, they do come up and figure out how to do this, or they already have always known how to do this, and the average sheeple are just unaware of it. We don't know. Exactly. But we exactly. just figured we'd just do a little light version tonight on urban legends when it comes to time travelers, but... I just want to say thank you, everybody, for coming back and being patient with us when we're off and on so many times. We've just had so many things going on with our life and health issues and everything else. But I just want to say thanks to everybody for coming. Thanks for always sharing us and helping us grow. And, you know, we'll see you again when – I don't know. What are we going to do? I think we're going to do, like, some kind of We don't of see them in the first place. Yeah. Oh, I want to thank I see them all the time. I have the special <laughs> ah, power you, you don't. I want to thank Richard Armad for doing a good job tonight. Uh, I want to thank everyone for coming and listening to us. And I want to thank Raven for a good show tonight. Join us September 22nd, 9 p.m. East, 8 p.m. Eastern. I'll get it out. 8 p.m. Eastern, 9 uh, 8 p.m. Central, 9 p.m. Eastern. Ugh. 6 p.m. Pacific. There you go. Uh, we don't have a topic yet. Uh, we will post a, uh, our topic on our uh, Facebook page. And yeah, I hope but, everyone has a good week. And subscribe to us on YouTube and follow us on Google and Facebook. And please share us with and others and of, help us to grow so we keep doing our shows. If you like it, you know, share us with others. And any other social medium you happen to be a member of. Good night, everyone. And thank you so much for coming in and listening.